Indeed, the number of top earners benefiting from very low levels of tax increased in the four years 1999-2003 from 15% to 18.25%, one in five. And it was interesting that the top 400 earners, three of them reduced their liability to zero, and 48 kept their liability below 5%. And then they turned to low-paid civil servants, people who would qualify for family income supplement, and they say they must be hit first, and these people I describe left intact. That is what politics is about. You must know whose side you are on on this issue. I would say this, <laughs> given, given such encouragement then, you might say, as all these people I've described, you might see why they needed regulation with a light touch. Indeed, you might see why they needed a bank of their own, and that is how Anglo-Irish came into existence. But you might ask as well, because this is one of my rare occasions for having a public an audience like this. And indeed, who knows, some member of the media might pay some attention to my eccentricities as I ask this question. Why is it so difficult for wealth to be discussed in contemporary Ireland? Many of the commentators who write endlessly, and the party leader will be asked, no doubt, which part of public expenditure will you be cutting? Which income tax will you be raising? And yet, at the same time, we never get a question as to what part of wealth are you going after first. This isn't accidental. There's more than an absence of time. There's more than an absence of scholarship involved. There is an exercise of caution, of fear, in conditions where there is a strong tendency to monopoly in the media. It is not an allowed question. Of course, it is a constant finding, I say, from my previous life, from wealth tax studies, their opposition to wealth tax is based much more on what would be revealed by any such tax than the yield that any such taxes might give. The politics of the right, comrades, that gave property-related tax breaks to those who thought paying tax was for little people. The politicians of the right who sneered at the social provision of the Scandinavian social economies as backward and encouraging disincentives to individual wealth gave as their alternative to the social economy, unrestricted market economics and regulation with a light touch. Thus they facilitated the degradation of governance and sacrificed trust at home and Ireland's reputation abroad. We should remember too that the proponents of market extremism, as I have said, have not gone away, nor have they reformed. They are opposed by Labour at every step of the way and will be opposed until the consequences of their failed model, and that is what we must do as delegates and members of the Labour Party, we must make sure that we expose what I have said and made a beginning to the building of the real alternative, a responsible social model of the economy. The politics of the right cannot be the alternative that addresses our current situation or our prospects for the future. That politics, I repeat, is toxic in social economic terms. And it is recognised as such, not only in Ireland, but in one disaster area after another around the world. It is how Nobel laureates like Amata Sin and Joseph Stiglitz describe the consequences of the Chicago School. Yet here in Ireland, where nobody on the right ever admits a mistake, the old politics, the bad economics, is presented as the sole source of the alternative in a media devoted more to celebrities' comment than to any substantial critique. There is also what I am afraid I must now directly call a certain moral cowardice involved among those who refuse to recognise the difference between the politics and economics of the right and the politics and economics of the left. It is more than simply lazy to refer to all politicians in the phrase, the politicians and thus tacitly subscribe to the fiction that there is no difference. The difference is in the half a million unemployed. Indeed, it is worse than lazy. It is a serious contribution to public cynicism at best, and at worst a celebration of political ignorance. I feel free to say this 
as a politician of my age. I feel free to say this, but I also feel it necessary to say it. I feel that those who will not recognise the difference between right and left, but who know it, are cowards, moral cowards. And I call on them, really, to examine, really, how they appropriate genuine discourse with alternatives. Or is it the view that they have that the people wouldn't be up to it? So let it be said, then, Labour's policies did not deliver our present chaos. Labour's policies also would have made a difference if implemented in their place. And Labour's policies now are the real alternative, based on equitable, ethical, transparent and achievable policies. And I finally say this. What is needed now is a campaign to build a new citizenship. That is the only true basis and the only meaning of true solidarity. It is the best prospect for a return to trust, a trust that, as I have said, has been squandered at so many levels. We need a viable political system with clear options and clear choices. We need a discourse that is capable of handling all of the possible ethical and moral connections between economy, society and state. And this simply cannot be a discourse of experts. It must be a publicly informed discourse with real participation. Nor either, lest we be tempted, can we afford to jettison real and important areas of scholarship and policy, such as economics, sociology, law and administration. We cannot afford to substitute a celebratory populism for real policy discussion, choice and decision. It is not a time for anti-intellectualism. Neither can the new citizenship we are required to create be reduced to an appeal for voluntary activity. Much more is at stake. It is about delivering and achieving a consensus on the values by which we can live together beyond individualism, with justice, equality and with respect for the environment.